fancy a row, old sport? Hi, I'm Leslie Sharon Beck, the History Chick, and I'm here on the grounds of Princeton University, where on today's episode we'll be uncovering some of the hidden history and little unknown secrets of Princeton. We're here on the grounds of Princeton University, once called the College of New Jersey, and through these halls many famous people have walked. Supreme Court Justices, F. Scott Fitzgerald, before he dropped out, and famed President Woodrow Wilson. Now you won't find his name on any of the halls anymore because it's been eradicated due to his racist policies, but it was here that Princeton gave Woodrow Wilson his PhD, earning him the title of doctor, and one of the only presidents to have one. Princeton University is known for its unique architecture. If you take a look at the chapel's drain pipe, you'll notice a hidden bulldog. Now, many think that this was an homage to Yale or that its architect placed it there on purpose, but in actuality, it's just another hidden facet and gem of Princeton University's campus. If you want to find the bulldog, he's facing Dickinson Hall. Fancy a meal, old sport. We're standing here outside of the Cottage Club at Princeton University. In fact, this was the social organization that F. Scott Fitzgerald wanted to join when he came here to campus. Now, F. Scott stayed here in the 1900s. It was said that this was what gave him the inspiration of this side of paradise. But these clubs are actually a little bit of a controversial history in Princeton's past. So Princeton outlawed fraternities and sororities. So in the 1800s, these became the answers to having a place for juniors and seniors. So they were usually for upperclassmen to eat fine dining. In fact, the Cottage Club was founded by men known as the Seven Wise Men of Greece. And we're not talking about the country, we're talking about the slop that they would serve in Princeton's dining hall. These clubs became the epicenter of who's who and what's what on a Saturday and Sunday night, and they still are to this day. <laughs> We're here at Princeton Battlefield, and we're specifically at the site of a sad yet interesting tale of George Washington's troops here that occurred on January 3rd, 1777. So it was right in this spot where supposedly Brigadier General Hugh Mercer decided not to leave his men after he was bayoneted seven times with a bayonet sticking in him to make sure that the boys at Princeton were successful in their attempt to conquer the British. You know, Mercer, who was George Washington's best friend, had led men into battle. He came across on his horse. His horse was shot down from underneath him, and the British, who thought that they captured George Washington, surrounded him. Mercer didn't go down without a fight. So, standing up and seeing himself surrounded, he decided to fight for his life. Faithfully, he, as I was said, was bayoneted and laid himself up against this tree to watch the rest of the battle fall out. Now, the tree fell in 2000 due to old age, but the interesting thing is, that's an offspring of the tree that was planted in 1981. So the Summer Soldier and the Sunshine Patriot still live here at Princeton Battlefield. Here at the crew house of Princeton University, which can be found on the beautiful Lake Carnegie. And let me tell you a little bit about the hidden historical gems here at Lake Carnegie. So Lake Carnegie was named after Andrew Carnegie, that's right, the robber baron or captain of industry of the 1890s Gilded Age fame. Now, Carnegie actually donated the $118,000 that it cost to build this lake. Why might you ask? Well, he was getting his portrait painted by a Princeton alumnus by the last name of Butler, who was a graduate of the 1876 class. Butler and Carnegie had a conversation about how Carnegie missed locks and the waterways of Scotland. And after exploring the area and Butler talking to Carnegie about the Delaware and Raritan Canal, he decided that he was going to donate a very generous gift in order to make this lake happen. This is actually the location, as you can see over there, where Princeton does some of their rowing and their crews. But it's an interesting little piece of Princetonian history that when Butler got Carnegie to donate this lake, when the lake was opened, they chanted, Andy, Andy, you're a dandy. We wanted bread. You gave us cake. <laughs> This may just look like an ordinary house here on 112 Mercer Street in Princeton, but did you know E equals MC squared? That's who lived here, Albert Einstein. So for the last 20 years of his life, Einstein was a resident of Princeton. He comes to Princeton in 33. Now he doesn't start his 
life in Princeton here. He actually lived in two other locations and for 10 days at the Peacock Inn, which we'll be taking a libation at later. But while Einstein was here, he lived in this house. He never taught at Princeton. He worked for the Institute. And very interestingly enough, he could be seen frequenting Lake Carnegie on a sailboat or walking around Princeton, of course, sans socks. Einstein ends up donating this house, never wanting it to be used for anything else than Institute purposes, and that's what it remains today. I'm not throwing away my shot to tell you about the final resting place of Vice President and notorious Hamilton duelist, Aaron Burr. So Aaron Burr was Vice President underneath. Thomas Jefferson. He's most notoriously known for killing Alexander Hamilton in a duel in Weehawken, New Jersey. And we're here at Princeton Cemetery where this is his final resting place. Now, Burr, although Hamilton made him the anti-hero, I'm going to let you decide what you think about Burr's legacy. So Burr actually was a large proponent of women's rights. His daughter Theodosia was raised with more knowledge and more languages spoken than most young men of her time. In addition to that, Burr was a huge proponent of getting rid of slavery early on in our nation's founding. And it's only really through the Hamilton duel and popular media culture that Burr becomes pretty synonymous as the villain. Burr had a pretty famous uh, family line. In fact, he came from a lineage of the Edwards family. Now, the Edwards, as you can see pictured behind Burr's grave, they were presidents of Princeton University. For all of the English teachers and English students alike, you probably remember Jonathan Edwards for his famous Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God poem, the perfect puritanical piece to analyze uh, as a part of the Great Awakening. But these are their final resting spots here at Princeton Cemetery. We're going to check out a presidential gravesite next. When visiting the Princeton Cemetery, you've got to check out and pay your respects to former President Grover Cleveland. Cleveland, born in Caldwell, New Jersey, served two non-consecutive terms in office. And Cleveland, actually interestingly enough, was one of the first presidents to get married in the White House to his wife, Frances, who is buried alongside of him. Now, Cleveland has a pretty modest tombstone, but we're going to debunk a myth for you right here. So next to him is his daughter, Ruth. Now, legend used to speculate that the candy bar Baby Ruth was named after his daughter. But the reality is, Baby Ruth was named after that famous baseball player. Babe Ruth because it was originally Babe's Ruth that he used to bite into. Even though we're not in the same location as it originally was, we're at the Peacock Inn to end our night with a libation and it was here that the Continental Congress actually stayed as well as Albert Einstein for 10 nights, obviously not in the same decade. When going to the Peacock Inn, make sure to look out for this original Prohibition artifact hanging just behind the bar. It's a 1920s drink menu for their speakeasy, Peacock Alley, which was located in the basement of the building. In addition to the modest by today's standard prices of booze, you'll be sure to get a feel of what this era was like, as patrons here wish to let their joys alone be remembered now. I'm Leslie Sharon Beck. Thanks for watching. Like and subscribe to the History Check. This is the last word. Cheers. So these clubs are like the premier place to go on a Saturday and Sunday night here at Princeton. They have all different sorts of theme parties. I don't have the 10K lying around that it costs to join one, but I think I would be able to get past the bickering process. So seven out of these 11 supper clubs have to go through a rigorous set of interviews that instead of pledging or rushing, they're known as the bicker. So we're here at Princeton but the actuality is a cicada just flew on my videographer. She's going to have a panic attack. Mood.